great to be able to spend some time with you all this afternoon. Wonderful pleasure. How are you doing, Sister Ellen? Good to see you. <laughs> let's, um, for, for my sake, um, let's have another word of, of prayer. Father, we are thankful for the Sabbath and thankful for the opportunity to come together and spend time uh, learning how we can better cooperate with you and what you're doing um, so that this earth can be filled with your glory, so that our lives can be filled with your glory, so that our communities can be filled with your glory. Um, be with us in every way, in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, everybody sees this right here, right? I am the, I'm, how many of you believe, well, first of all, who said that? Jesus, right? How many of you believe that? So if we believe that, then it means that if we wanna learn the best way to have success when doing evangelism, when soul winning, who should we look to? And if we look to Jesus, then we'll have success. How many of you believe that? Yeah, yeah, I, I believe that. So what I'm gonna share with you is, um, I'm gonna share something with you, and after I share it with you, I'll tell you where I got it from. All good preachers get their content from somewhere else. Um, a book, another preacher. <laughs> so I'll share that with you as we come to the end. Uh, let's take a look at a couple of passages of scripture. I'm gonna put some up here, then I'm gonna ask you all to read some of them. This is Luke chapter 10, verse two. Uh, let's read that together. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. How many of you have heard that passage before? Yeah, that's great. So why are our churches not filled? Huh? You said what now? <laughs> no, not, not enough laborers. We're not trained. You know, we could give a lot of, of, uh, of answers, but Jesus suggests that there is a tremendous harvest that is, is, is just waiting. It's just waiting. So I want to pose a question. The way that we do evangelism, are our efforts worth keeping up? Are we reaching our objectives? Or that's not to say that we don't have any success but I'm asking the question, are you satisfied? Are you satisfied? Now, some of you who may have been around this church for a long time, uh, you know, I love talking with the old saints and they're like, oh, man, whether it's Warren or any of the other churches, they're like, man, you know, this church used to be bursting at the seams, didn't have enough room to, you know, and I'm like, wow, what happened, right? But we've been doing evangelism. We've been trying to win people. We've been trying to, you know, invigorate and revive our churches. But again, the question, our, are our efforts worth keeping up? Um, and I want to suggest this. I'm not saying it. I'm just suggesting it. What if we've been going about it all wrong? What if we've been going about it all wrong? So, I'm actually, before I get to that, I want you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 14. And we're gonna, we're gonna start here, stick our fingers in this, and come back to it, and hopefully you'll understand why I went here, and you will see a transition and a transformation. Matthew chapter 14, are we there? All right, can, uh, can someone, just take a verse and um, 
and read for us. And, and each person, next person, can read the next verse. Chapter one, verse one? Cha no, uh, chapter 14, beginning with verse 15, please. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Right here. Yeah. Uh, then he commanded the multitudes to all to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up into heavens, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. And they, they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Let me see. Immediately, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. All right, now can I, can I ask, I'm gonna ask you to do some biblical gymnastics here, but you're gonna be, you're gonna land this one. You know, we're all gonna give you a 10. Turn to John chapter six, John chapter six. verses 14 and 15. John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Excellent, thank you. So everybody's, just to make sure we're all on the same page, Jesus feeds how many people? 5,000 besides women and children, right? And at the end of it, the people's response is what? We just read it in John chapter six. They wanna do what? Make him a king. They want to take him by, they want to make him a king, but they want to take him by, they want to take him by force and make him a king. Now, guess who was in cahoots with this design or this plan to take Jesus by force and make him king? Pharisees. Come on, say that again, Pastor. Pharisees. It was the disciples. So the disciples were in agreement. I want you to follow me. They were in agreement to take Jesus by force and make him king. Now, I want you just let that, let that sink in. Let that settle in. They were supposed to be following who? They're supposed to be following Jesus. But at this particular point, they are willing to co-op the leadership role from Jesus and actually force him to do what they want him to do. You would never do that, would you? Watch it, watch it. You know I'm setting you up, right? <laughs> we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this, okay? But please understand the disciples are in on this. They agree with the multitudes to take Jesus by force and make him king. So I'm going to share with you uh, about seven or eight principles really quick. And I'm going to tell you when I'm done why, what, why these principles are extremely important in the context of what we've just read after the feeding of the 5,000, all right? So, uh, principle number one, selection. What's principle number one? Men were his method. Men were his method. So, oh, what are we gonna do for, you know, what method are we gonna use? Are we gonna have a public meeting? Are we gonna go, you know, hope for the homeland? Are we gonna, you know, uh, uh, any other number of things that you can do? But Jesus' method was actually people. That's it. It was simple. No big, you know, 
uh, no colorful this, that, or the other. It was just people. Men were his method. Now, I want to suggest to you that this is unique because Jesus selected his disciples. You and I do not select those who will become followers of Christ. Sometimes we would like to. Sometimes we would like to select just the type of people that we would love to come in. But no, 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 that's not how it works. We just share Christ and we share his message and whosoever will let him come. And then it's our responsibility by the grace of God to begin to love, uh, compassionately care for, teach, encourage and disciple those individuals. But Jesus is uh, just going over his pattern. Jesus, uh, he actually he actually selected. Now, somebody might say, well, why don't we select? First Samuel chapter 16, verse seven. I know you all have heard this before when the prophet goes to select the next king of Israel and he's looking around. and Oh, yeah, that one. Oh, nice, tall, big, oh, strong. Uh -huh, God, no, that's not him. And the next one. Oh, yeah, this one. No, that's not him. Right. So God rejects um, Jesse's older sons. And he says to Samuel that man looks on the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. This is why you and I would do a horrible job of picking disciples. We would have voted Judas to be the, 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 the most holy and spiritual disciple of all. Right. And so we don't do the selecting. The spirit of God does. And uh, men are his method. Let's take a look at a couple of passages. I've got these on the screen for you. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they did what? They followed Jesus. Then this has always fascinated me. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, what are you looking for? Why are you following me? That's my translation. They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. The reason why this is so powerful to me is because. Guess what they didn't ask Jesus for. No, they did ask him, where are you staying? They didn't ask him for a Bible study. Now, I know that's rubbing y'all the wrong way. Y'all like, wait a minute, what do you mean? But they instead asked, where are you staying or where do you live? And what did Jesus do? He said, he invited them to come to his home. So listen to me, friends. Before they were taught about his religion, they were, they were shown his religion. Now, I do believe that when they got there, they probably asked some questions about his messiahship and his interpretation. And I'm sure Jesus gave those things. But notice the context it was in. It was in the context of his home. It wasn't in the context of a hall. It wasn't in the context of a church. Not that a hall or a church are bad. But remember what we started with. I am the I am the way Jesus's method was to say, come home with me. Come home with me, because let me ask you this question. Is it possible for us to be profound when it comes to teaching and yet very weak when it comes to living? That's OK. OK, let's move on. So. We got to understand this. Getting big, growing was not Jesus's priority. Now, again, I know I'm, this is like, but we talking about evangelism, pastor. But growing was not Jesus's number one priority. Right. Jesus needed leaders. He needed what? Oh, say that again. He needed what? Leaders. He needed leaders in order to instruct the masses. Let me suggest to you that you guys held a, a series and you, you sent out flyers and whatnot and you know, the pastor preached his heart out, Giancarlo you know, made the appeal and you know, give your heart to Jesus. 
and 3,000 people responded to that call. Would your church be prepared for those 3,000 people? What would you do with them? Wait, do you have enough leaders? Because even if you say, well, we're going to do Acts chapter 2, where we break them up into groups, and that's great. That's a great biblical plan. Now, who's going to lead all of those groups? Do you have enough? Or do they have the same challenge at Warren that, that most churches have? You got the same group of people who are doing the, no, not here. No, no, I know you guys. <laughs> so, was it even possible for Jesus and his, and his humanity to, to care for millions of people? He needed, this is why he needed leaders. Jesus' is Jesus' method was quite different from ours because our methods tend to focus on the masses when Jesus' method focuses on individuals. And when we focus on individuals, you'll see what happens as we go along. And I want to suggest this to you. Victory is never achieved through the multitude. How can I say that? Jesus said, Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life, and a whole lot of people, no, 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 few there be that find it, but broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Okay, so the second principle is association. What's that principle? Um, Mark chapter 3, verse 14. Mark chapter 3, verse 14. And I'll just have you, I'll have someone read that for us, please. And he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. All right. Profound two-step process in Jesus' method of evangelism. First, he selects, he associates, excuse me, he sets aside his disciple. And the second principle is association. Notice before he sends them out to preach, what, what's the prerequisite? To be with him. To be with him. So, in other words, Jesus didn't send someone to go and do something for him without first giving them the opportunity to spend time to be with him. Because when we spend time with Jesus, it's transformational, right? It's wonderful. And in fact, when we spend time with Jesus, we become excited and we want to go out and share with others. Is that right? So before Jesus said, go, Jesus said, first, come, come. So uh, association is the second principle. The third principle is consecration. What's the third principle? Consecration. consecration. So Jesus needed his followers to be committed. It's as simple as that, committed. And um, let me ask you, what does it mean? What does commitment mean to you? Surrender self, what'd you say? Faithfulness. You're going to do it no matter what, right? So Jesus, this was the prerequisite to be a follower of Christ. You needed to be committed. Now, what prerequisites would you have if somebody told you they wanted to be a follower of Christ? I mean, I'm serious. I'm just throwing it out there. Don't be smiling at me like that. What, what prerequisites would you have? All right, you got to give your heart to him. Yeah, but what is that? What if they asked you, okay, but what do I, what's tangible? What do, what do I have to do that's tangible to, 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 to signify that I want to be a follower of Christ? It's free. Hmm? Believe. It's free? You say what? Believe. You have to believe? Yeah, you guys are all, you, you're giving great answers here. Go ahead, go ahead. You need to follow him. Yes, all of these are wonderful things. Search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And if I was smoking marijuana, you'd tell me just search the scriptures, right? So put that down then. So, now come on, sis. That's what I'm talking about, right? You need to put that down. Then search the scriptures, right? And, and listen, and listen, I, you know, I'm, what I'm suggesting is if we're honest with ourselves, if we just meet someone right off the streets and we engage with them, we would probably want them to let go of certain things 
and then follow Christ. We would say, give that up and then follow Christ. And Jesus's, Jesus's requirement was commitment to him. And listen, I don't, I don't believe you're going to still be smoking marijuana if you keep walking with Jesus. I don't believe you're going to be doing everything you used to be doing as long as you continue to walk with Jesus. But a lot of times we make that the first thing without really asking whether or not a person is committed. I, I share this story. I used to work with campus ministries and I remember I did a series at um, Eastern Michigan University and, you know, a young man at the end of the series was one of several who um, he wanted to be baptized. So he said, man, I want to be baptized, but I don't know about joining a church. And I was like, hmm. I'm like, you know, elaborate on that. And so he was like, man, I don't, you know, I don't trust institutions, organizations, blah, 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 this, this, that, and the other. But I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. You know what I told that brother? I said, man, I can't baptize you unless you're willing to join my church. And you know how to look back on that? And my heart feels that I made a terrible mistake. Yeah, oh, yours too, huh? <laughs> Thank you. Somebody agrees with me. I felt like I made a terrible mistake because what I should have done was said, let's walk together. Let's walk together. Does he have good reasons not to, tr not to trust churches? He probably does. Does he need time to determine whether or not he can trust my church and me for that instant, for that matter? Is that going to happen like that? Should I ask him to just take it on faith? You know, there's this passage that says, beloved, believe not every spirit, but do what? Test the spirits, try them, right? And so we're not in the habit of just asking people to accept something without saying, listen, no, you need to test this. You need to try it. But, you know, um, I don't know how that would have worked out. I'm sure the spirit of God would have given me wisdom on how to do it. But I told that young man, no. I told him, I can't baptize you. I can't do it because you won't join my church. Now, I could give you a whole thing. That's not what we're here for on what it means to be baptized into Christ and being a part of Christ's body. And, you know, sometimes we think that the only part of Christ's body is the particular congregation that we belong to. But that's another that's another subject for another day. The next principle is impartation. What's the next principle? impartation. Actually, let me give you these texts. John chapter 6, you can just write them down, verses 67 to 69. John chapter 6, verses 67 to 69, and that's where Jesus, after feeding the multitudes and then speaking to them about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, some people say, man, that's a hard saying. I, I, I don't want any I don't want any part of that. And the Bible says that many of them left and they never followed Jesus again. However, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, will you leave too? And they said, we're not going anywhere. Where else would we go? You're the only one who has the words of life, right? So they were committed to Christ even when he asked them to do difficult things even when he asked them to do things that they did not fully or completely understand, their commitment was solid. So the next one we said was impartation. Impartation. Jesus gave of himself. John chapter 15, verse 15. Can someone read that for us? John chapter 15, Verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. All right. Listen to what Jesus said. No more do I call you what? But I call you friends. So how many of you have Bible study contacts? Don't raise your hand. You knew I just set you up for that, right? I just set you up. 
No longer do I call you contact, but I call you friend, right? Jesus, and man, this is the other problem when we're trying to do things in large numbers. How many authentic friendships can you carry on at once? Right? They're, you can't. That's why like, I'm overwhelmed by social media. You know, when I, I do have a Facebook page and I'll, I'll, you know, look at it and it's just too much. And I'm seeing people that I knew back home in Ohio where I grew up and people I went to school with and people who, and I'm just like, ah, people I met this place and that place. And I'm like, it's, it's too much. No one of us can really have that many genuine and authentic friendships at a time, right? But if we are doing discipleship or evangelism on this enormous level, then guess what we're missing out on? We're missing out on the opportunity to legitimately and authentically connect with people. And I'm going to suggest to you that this is what people are hungering and thirsting for. Genuine and authentic connection, friendship. People know when they are a project to you. They know that. They know when you're just spending time and investing because you want them to and then you're going to move on and so forth and so on. They can sense that versus when there is an authentic and a genuine concern for who they are as an individual. And this is a relationship that does not need to be broken, right? It doesn't need to be broken because, okay, now I have to give time to these other people over here. Anybody ever done that? Don't raise your hand. I'll raise mine. I'll raise mine. One year in my church, baptized like 18 people. And you know, there were several problems with that. The first problem was um, that I studied with all 18 of those people. Now at the time, I was like, yes, 18 baptisms. And I'm studying, I'm busy, and I'm working for the da 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 this, this, that, and the other. And the church celebrated with me. But it was, a, it was a serious, fatal mistake because there was no way for me to continue to disciple 18 people. Especially, again, if my goal is to continue increasing the kingdom. What am I going to do with these 18 people now? You see? You know who needed to be engaging with preparing and becoming friends with those 18 people? Not just the pastor, the other members of the church. And as they develop friendships, once they are baptized, those friendships can just naturally continue on, right? So Jesus gave of himself, but there is a, a reality that we have to face, and that's we, can, we only have so much to give, right? You have family, you know, you have friends, you have work, you have church, you know, relationships and community and things like that. So probably... You can take one person, one person, and build a relationship with that one person realistically, right? Build a relationship with that one person. But here's the beauty of this thing. How many relationships does the one person have? They have people they work with that you don't know. They have family that you may have been introduced to, but you don't know all of them. And so as you continue your relationship with them, and as Christ is flowing through you and I into them, then now Christ begins to flow through them into all of their relationships, right? And so this process continues and it goes on and on. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. The next principle is demonstration. Demonstration. I have another presentation uh, that I go over. I'm, it's kind of a companion to this, but I'm not sharing it with you. But it, I start off and I share why people are afraid of discipleship and why, people are, why, we're, why we tend to be more comfortable with mailing out thousands of flyers and you know, inviting people to come, why we're more comfortable with that. And this is, this is going to touch on one of them. John chapter 13, verse 15. Can someone read that? John chapter 13, verse 15. 
for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Mm, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So one of the important things in demonstration is that we need to give a living example of what it is we want others or what it is we are inviting others into. Now, I told you that's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for a lot of us. And here's the, here's the thing. It's uncomfortable because we're like, oh, me, but I'm not, I'm not perfect. I can't do this. You know, I'm not the greatest at this and I'm not the greatest at that. And oh man, I don't want them to meet my family. You know, I got this brother and he's crazy. Or I got this, you know, I don't want them to meet my husband or my wife, or I don't want them to, and it's just like, uh, no, I can't ever have anybody come. And, and so we become comfortable keeping people at a distance. But when it comes to Christianity, discipleship evangelism, we cannot. Now, we do it, it just doesn't work. We tell people what to do, and we don't show them what it looks like. So somebody comes into the church, they're new, and their children are making a fuss. This is why I don't flip out on, you know, little children doing what little children do in church. They just need to get used to it, right? But sometimes we'll look at them like, how come you don't know how to train your child? <laughs> but if they, just, if they just came to church, guess what? Maybe they don't know how to prepare a child to come into a church service where the pastor is long-winded. Not, not, not here, I'm talking about me. Where the pastor is long-winded and, you know, announcements go on and on and so forth and so on. So instead of us just saying, this is what you need to do, guess what we need to do? We need to show them. And in order for us to show them, guess what the best way is? Bring them into your home. And where is it that children are prepared for sanctuary? It's in the home during family worship. So we bring them into our homes and we allow them to see how we conduct family worship in order to prepare the minds of the children, you see? So this is very different than, you know, uh, we wanna stick you off in a corner or we're gonna send somebody to help you. This is saying, listen, no, come and see. Come and see, right? Jesus is the, the secret to the influence of Jesus' spiritual life was that Jesus was intentional. Now, when I say, you know, I, I say, man, we need to invite people to our homes. How personal did it get for Jesus when he was discipling? Let me share with you how personal it got. Um, <laughs> you can write these passages down. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15. And then Matthew chapter 13, verses 9 through 11. This is how personal it became with Jesus. And I, you know, there's a lot here. Please don't, don't hesitate to ask questions. But it became so personal in terms of this demonstration and Jesus inviting people close to him that Jesus' disciples, I know what you guys are going to think after I say this, and I want somebody to ask me. So Jesus' disciples were so close to him that they heard his prayers. And when they heard his prayers, what did they say? Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Right? So now, you know, I'm not going to suggest that now you're like, oh, but pastor, aren't we supposed, and I'm not suggesting that in your personal, private, you know, time with God that you invite people, you know, into that, even though that's what Jesus did. But again, if you invite someone into your, into your home and you study together and you begin to pray together, then they are listening to the way that you you ever been around someone or maybe you've had the experience yourself where you've been hesitant to publicly pray? You're like, no, I'm, not, I'm just not comfortable doing that. In my, in my closet, just me and God, I mean, I can, I can just talk to the Lord, but in front of people, like, ah, I'm, I'm just not. 
But listen, the biblical example of Jesus is that Jesus' disciples, they heard him pray. And I think they were not impressed necessarily with, you know, the eloquent nature of his prayers, but it's like, man, I, I can only imagine, this is me, that they're like, man, he talks to him. He talks to the Father like he knows him. He talks to the Father like he's right there, like he just knows, like, you know, the, 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 the Pharisees and the scribes, we don't hear them pray like that. Man, this is real. Man, I just get a sense that this is a real connection. How do I pray like that? So when we invite people in and when there's demonstration that's taking place, it becomes personal. It becomes you and I also sharing with people how we study the scriptures, right? That's one thing for, for me to get up and maybe I preach or I teach and people are like, wow, that was great. Or man, I never looked at that passage that way before. It's a different thing for me to sit down with someone and say, listen, this is how, this is how I approach the Bible. You're going to develop your own way, but let me share with you some of the tips and tools that I use when I'm trying to study the Bible. And instead of just saying, have a devotional life, again, I say, hey, for the next 30 days or 60 days, let's study together. Are you a morning person or an evening person? Let's set aside time and let's go through the book of James together. We're both going to read and maybe we get another book and let's talk and let's share. And I'll, I'll teach you some of, some of the tools that I have for going through scripture. You can share with me what you learn and we'll go through it together. So again, this is demonstration, but a demonstration that invites the next one is delegation. Delegation. This is Mark chapter 6, verse 7. Um, and he called the 12 to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. Jesus actually gave those he was discipling something to do. Now, I got to say this. If you are so comfortable doing whatever it is that you are doing that you can't let it go and let someone else do it, you got a problem. If I'm discipling someone the way that Jesus did, by the way, oh, help me, Lord. Oof. By the way, how many people did Jesus baptize? None. Why? His disciples, he allowed his disciples to baptize. Now, now, now look at this. Listen at this. Listen at this. Did his disciples understand or did his disciples have right theology when they were baptized? No, because they hadn't even fully accepted that he is the Messiah was going to be crucified. They didn't want any part of that, didn't want to hear it. And yet Jesus gave them an opportunity to participate and gave them something to do that would allow them to experience success while working with the master, right? So he preached, he brought the conviction, and then he said, here, my disciples will baptize you, right? So Jesus allows people who don't have all of their theology, all of their theological ducks in a row, he allows them to participate. Why? Because discipleship is a process that is a continuing or ongoing process. It's not just, okay, the series is over, boom, the meetings are over, boom, there you are. No, it's an ongoing, continuous walk. So Jesus, um, he delegated, and not only did he do that, not only did he do this with the 12, he also does it with the 70. And here's the beautiful thing as well. When the 70 come back, it's an example that Jesus doesn't just delegate and give someone work to do because, man, I don't feel like doing this and I need you to help me, sister. <laughs> you know, it's not just about that. Jesus actually gives or delegates work. And then when they come back, he receives a report on how it went. What did you experience? Lord, even the spirits were subject unto us. They're excited. They're just, and Jesus is like, okay, that's great. But let me tell you, don't, 
don't just rejoice that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather that your names are written in heaven. So here's what Jesus does. Listen to this. Listen to this, friends. In discipleship, Jesus doesn't just delegate, but he also gives them perspective on their work. Why does he do that? Because he doesn't want them to get too high and he doesn't want them to get too low. Have you ever been a friend with someone who's walking along with God and they become extremely discouraged after having been extremely excited? (laughs) And so Jesus says, hey, listen, that's great that you had that experience, but there's an even greater experience. So Jesus is preparing them. He's preparing them. They've had success, but he's preparing them for experiences where they don't have the success that they would anticipate. He's teaching them how to focus on the greater good. Are you guys with me? You, you get me? Okay, three people get me. Y'all, y'all like, I don't know about that. Okay, okay, all right. So, so Jesus delegates, but he doesn't just delegate. Oh, mercy. I, I came to, I'm going to tell on my church. I came to my church family at Troy, and I found out that somebody was serving in a position, and they had received absolutely no training to serve in that position. And I was like, oh. Now, I know that. Troy is probably the only church that that has ever happened at where someone has been asked to serve in a position because there was a desire to get them active and get them a part of, you know, everything that's going on in the church life. Okay, so don't do that. Don't do that. Let's prepare people and then let's walk beside them. Let's walk beside them. Let's let's have a weekly encounter. How's it going this week? You know, how's the plan going? How the the process is going out? How's this, that, and the other? You know, I'm really discouraged. Ah, don't worry. These folks in here are knuckleheaded. You know, they 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 don't they don't they don't listen the first time. You gotta go and talk to them again, right? And encourage them along the way instead of just throwing them out and <laughs> saying, swim, swim, swim. Um Jesus was also he was also intentional in his delegation because he asked them, and I'm going to give you some passages to write down. I'm not going to go over them all. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 10, verse 11. All of these are pretty much from the same chapter. Matthew chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. And then Matthew chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. So Jesus' intentionality was this. He asked them to start where he knew that they would be most successful. Then he asked them to concentrate their time on the most serious individuals. He said, listen, those who are essentially open, that's who I want you to focus on. Then he encouraged them, when you find people who are not open, shake the dust off of your feet and keep moving. And, and what, what's, what's another way to put that? Let me see if you can reframe that. Push on. I like that. Push on. Anyone else? You can feel that there's really the possibility of bringing that person to the Lord. Okay. Perhaps you can feel that there's the possibility of bringing them to the Lord. Or you can feel that there's not the possibility. Anyone else? Just move on. Let me, let, me, let me translate this. Keep praying for them. Keep praying for them. Yes, we definitely want to do that. Go ahead, Brother Cook. Looking for ripe fruit. Looking for ripe fruit. All right, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give you this one. Don't get discouraged when people are not interested. Is that something we need to know? Yes. You ever run into somebody who's not interested? Has it ever discouraged you? <laughs> Especially when it's someone that you care for, when it's someone that you value, when it's someone that you love deeply, right? And Jesus is suggesting, listen, do not become so discouraged when someone is uninterested that you just give it up and say, no, I'm not doing this anymore. And by the way, isn't that one of the reasons why we we don't want to do evangelism when it comes to reaching out to people? We don't like hearing no. And many of us, okay, let me get real here. Many of us, many of us have in our own personal lives, we have 
deep issues with rejection. And we bring this into our evangelistic efforts. And this is the reason why when someone says no, we take it personal as though they are saying, I am not good enough. As though they're saying, but see, I'm already wrestling with that, right? I'm already wrestling that, with that in my mind. I used to lead call porter teams and I used to sell the hardcover blue Bible story books. And, um, you know, then I used to train young people years ago. And one of the things that, that I, would, I would tell them or I would try to help them with is I would help them to be able to deep, um, depersonalize, that's not, that, that doesn't make sense. But I, I would try to help them to not, yeah, yeah, to desensitize them in one sense, but to separate someone saying no to Jesus from someone saying no to them. Right? Now, it still hurts when someone says no to Jesus, doesn't it? That's still not a good thing. That doesn't feel great. But imagine someone is saying no to Jesus and saying no to me. And I'm going to continue to subject myself to this? No, thank you. I will not be, you know, putting myself out there. But when we would go door to door, you know, we were going to receive more no's than yeses. And so we had to prepare them. We had to prepare them not to take it personal, to still be able to say, God bless you. I'm praying for you. Right. And still have a smile on their face even when they are leaving, no matter what a person has called them or what planet they have told them they are from, you know? <laughs> so Jesus prepared for all of this. He also taught them to expect hardship. Do not be afraid. And then, okay, okay, yeah, let me, let me, let me go on. Then he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Lastly, when Jesus delegated, Jesus gave them something that he knew would work. And of course, Jesus gave them power. Now, you and I can't give anybody power, but what, what can we give people? We can give hope. We can give encouragement. We can give love. We can give what? We can give our time. We can give our friendship. The word of God is quick and powerful, is it not? Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and of the intents of the heart. So when you and I share the word, not just sharing the word on a surface level, but when we teach people how to really, okay, this, this is the way I could, I, could, I could suggest. It would be like you inviting someone to your home and teaching them how to cook one of your favorite dishes. Right? When they leave, they are prepared, right? To be able to make that dish. Maybe they don't like all the ingredients you use and they want to add something of their own or maybe they want to make it just like you've made it. But because you've invited them in and you've showed them what the recipe is. Now you've equipped them so that they know how to go and do it themselves, right? And likewise, we can teach people how to handle the word of God so that when they go, they can feel confident that they have something in their hands and in their hearts that has power, right? And it's able to reach to the very heart. Lastly, supervision, we suggest it not lastly, but supervision. Uh, Jesus, he met with them on a consistent basis, even afterwards, and then reproduction. The greatest test, the greatest test of whether or not you and I are experiencing success in our discipleship process is whether or not we are reproducing. That's the greatest, the greatest test. Now, I suggested at the very beginning that the discipleship evangelism process is about leaders. And now I'm going to close 
And I'll give you I'll give you the reason why I say that. We looked at Matthew 14 and John 6. Jesus fed the multitude after teaching them and the multitude, the multitude wanted to take charge of Jesus. You guys with me, right? And the disciples were in cahoots with this. In Acts chapter 2, after having spent time with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is poured out. The disciples preach on the day of Pentecost. And 3,000, the Bible says, are converted in a day. And then if you read the end of Acts chapter 2, you read about how the disciples moved, the apostles moved to organize the early church. These continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, breaking bread, house to house, right? And, and fellowshipping and in prayer and so forth and so on. So you see two different, two different uh, reactions. The first one, the crowd takes control when there's no leaders. In Acts chapter 2, when there are leaders, the leaders actually manage the multitudes. And this is the reason, my dear friends, why Jesus doesn't just want masses of people, because the masses of people will then take control of the movement. But in Acts chapter 2, you see the Spirit moving, and the leaders are able to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they, they are able to manage the masses. So what if God were to bring 3,000 people into the Warren Church, and there were leaders. There were leaders. And we were walking beside, you know, one or two people, preparing them to be able to be leaders themselves. Then when God has a massive move and the Spirit is poured out and uh, the pews are filled to the point of overflowing, the multitudes and the masses won't take control of the movement, but instead, the Spirit of God will have leaders who are able to continue to disciple and encourage and grow the multitudes. And you see several times that example in the book of Acts. So discipleship evangelism, discipleship evangelism, one by one. Now look, I still believe in doing evangelistic campaigns. But before I do an evangelistic campaign, guess what I want? Let's pray together. Loving Father and our God, we are grateful for the example of Jesus. Lord, it's, it's sometimes it seems more expedient and convenient to do things our own way than it does to just follow Jesus. But I believe with all my heart what uh, we read in Ministry of Healing. Not, I didn't read it today, but I'm sure many have heard it. Christ's method alone will bring true success in reaching the people. Lord, help us to do things the way Jesus did. Help us to open our, not only our mouths, we need to do that, but help us to open our hearts. And not only our hearts, and we need to do that, but help us to open our homes as well so that we can demonstrate and invite people into seeing what it means to be a follower of Jesus from the private that the private life that takes place in the home to the public life in the church. Lord, continue to bless this congregation um, as disciple makers emerge from our time together in Jesus' name. Amen.